Hello, I'm going to be uh, lecturing on some um, catch-up stuff in this video for the um, Business 360 class and the 260 class, We're, but the format's going to be a little weird here. So if you are starting this video from the beginning and you're in the 260 section, um, you can skip ahead. And I, in the email that I sent out this link in, there is a timestamp that you can cut ahead to. Um, because this is material that we we got through on Tuesday and if you're in my 360 class this is material we didn't get to so this is to kind of catch you up to to get up to where where you were in the where where we got to in the 260 section but also after that point uh, we're gonna go and start getting ahead with a little bit of Kant here too so um, a little weird format bottom line if you're in 260 you can skip ahead if you're in 360 keep listening and we'll catch up a little bit here in finishing up the mill lecture um, okay so where we left off 360 students where we left off on Tuesday is I was talking about how mill is going to defend utilitarianism how is he going to argue for why you ought to be a utilitarian and um, we got through I, I mentioned that there were two steps to this argument and the first step which we got through which is is Mill's argument for why we should consider the principle of utility as a universal criteria of morality and what that really means to say that to say it's a universal criteria is to say that no matter what choice you're ever trying to make you need to think about the principle of utility as part of informing that action and I'm, I'm putting it in that thin way because we also have to think about step two um, remember, Mill is offering the principle of utility as not only um, something to think about or to hold uh, in balance while you're trying to make a decision that it like contributes something, but also that it's the only thing to be looking at in making that decision. So that's a much stronger claim. It's not Mill's not just saying utility always matters; it's always morally relevant uh, to any choice but also that it's the only thing that matters. This is a reductive account that everything that is morally significant is cashed out in terms of its significance for utility. So what that means is it's a universal criteria of morality, it's always relevant, but it's the only thing that is a universal criteria of morality. And it's that second step, like, why aren't there other universal criteria of morality other than utility? That's what the next second sort of phase of argumentation uh, Mill needs to do in order to shoulder his burden of proof in proving that utilitarianism or the principle of utility is everything about morality, that it, it, it exhausts morality. Okay, so I used a metaphor uh, in the past this quarter uh, when, we, when we started Mill. I talked about this metaphor of the moral landscape. And that every moral theory is trying to capture, it's trying to create a map that maps all those kind of contours to morality. And Mill believes that the principle of utility covers it all. It catches everything, all the contours, it, it maps perfectly onto what would be right and wrong under any set of circumstances. Um, so that's a very, very strong claim. And um, I th might have mentioned this in class, but you might have a kind of healthy skepticism about uh, this, these kinds of reductive accounts. And that was the kind of thing that I was mentioning Mill was savvy to from the opponents of utilitarianism, that they've got these objections like, utility isn't all there is to life. It's not just a matter of preference satisfaction or pain and pleasure. There are these other values that matter too. And Mill's like, yes, but they matter because of what they contribute to, to utility. So it is this kind of exhaustive approach. So you probably have a healthy skepticism about that because you might be thinking, you know, rules are good, um, but maybe only for certain circumstances, that they're sometimes right and sometimes wrong. And like I also mentioned in class with Mill, Mill's sensitive to that too. He's like, yeah, sometimes times change, things, it depends on the circumstances, right? But then we have to think, okay, what do, in what way do the circumstances affect that? And there needs to be some kind of answer for that, some kind of pattern. And Mill is thinking that that pattern is utility, maximizing utility. So is he right about that? That's what we need to explore here. Um, so let's go to a little picture I've, I've drawn here. And you saw this on the board on Tuesday. But I think this might also be helpful for framing up where this is all headed. So in this picture here, we've got this kind of pyramid going on. 
And all these things are like different things that we'd say are good. And down here with these arrows in the middle of the pyramid, we've got like something we say is good, like something that matters. And we might say, well, why does that matter? Well, it's for the sake of something else, which means this goodness is sort of conditional. It's contingent on something else being good. But then we ask, okay, well, why is that good? For the sake of something else, right? Well, sometimes this is good, sometimes it's bad, and it depends on something other that it, it gets its justification from. So at some point, that story's got to end. And that's it'll end with these first goods, these ultimate conditions of morality, the universal conditions for morality. Mill is saying that utility is up here. But there might be some other values here too. In other words, utility might theoretically share the throne here with other moral values. And there's two big ones. And this is not exhaustive because there, there could be other candidates here. Um, but there's two real classical uh, opponents here to utility or consequences that we might think morally matter. One of them could be this concern about virtue. Like, what, what, how does a good person look? Like, what characteristics do they have? Um, maybe being a good person is the point of morality uh, in the sense of having these kind of ideal character traits. We'll talk more about this with Aristotle, but that's a, that's a classic option here for how to understand morality. And another one is to think about justice or duty considerations, uh, sort of obligations that we have toward each other or to ourselves that make certain actions categorically wrong and that are sort of out of bounds, you might say, for any morally good action. Um, so the, we'll talk more about this with Kant. So this is kind of Mill's sort of savvy here to all of the like really leading competitors for uh, what could serve theoretically as an ultimate condition of morality. And what Mill ultimately wants to say is that virtue and justice are not universal conditions of morality. Utility is not sharing the throne with anything. So if we're saying, you know, everything that's good gets its goodness from, uh, from the way in which it can promote utility, well, it might also be good because it's able to promote justice or good because it contributes to virtue. You know, there could be other things here that are where the buck stops about why something is right or wrong or good or bad. But Mill, again, the second step of his argument is to say that, well, utility is the only criteria of morality. So what that's going to mean is that virtue and justice, Mill's going to say they're good things, but they're kind of underneath utility. They are goods down here like this one, that is, it's something good, but for the sake of utility. That's what he's going to be trying to argue. Um, and he's going to do it in different ways for these two opponents, but there's going to be a kind of similar strategy here. Um, before I get into this, though, let's just do a little recap of why Mill thought utility was a universal criteria of morality. <clears throat> um, I broke down that kind of main argument for you, but the kind of three crucial premises that get to Mill's conclusion here is one, that if we're asking questions about what we ought to care about or what has value, what is desirable, that our best guide for that is going to be to look at our feelings, at our sentiments. Um, this is Mill's position of sentimentalism, that the only thing that can ever be appealed to in an, at an ultimate level for why something is good or bad is going to have to be based on our feelings that uh, he thinks we have no other guide. We talked about how we can't use intuition. Mill also has an argument for why pure logic on its own is not going to serve either. Um, I'm not going to go through that argument um, because uh, just for the sake of time, um, we could do that. But um, Mill is arguing against Kant here, and I actually think his, his argument against Kant is not very good, that he m basically misunderstands Kant. So we'll just, we'll just look at Kant when we get there and see what you think of it. Uh, on its own, uh, rather than looking at Mill's comments here for, for right now. But um, Mill's argument is basically like, we don't have anything else to go off of here. There's no other source of evidence or something we can appeal to for why something ought to be desired other than that we do desire it. But there, at this stage, though, it's not like relativism or something. It's not like just what I care about is what's good for me. Um, but Mill is saying, like, if anyone cares about it, like, if someone has a sentiment that supports this value, 
that's some evidence that this thing is a candidate for something that we ought to care about. Now, if we all care about different things and there we don't have any kind of common shared values, then that is going to maybe threaten something like relativism, that there that all value is contingent, um, that there's nothing that is universally desirable because there's nothing that's universally desired. Um, that's going to be uh, the motivation for the next premise in the argument that's really crucial here, which is Mill's claim that actually there is something that we all care about. And that no matter what are the other differences in what we desire, we all think that it's good. We all have sentiments that back up uh, saying that when we get what we want or we don't get what we don't want, that's good. So this is another, I, I talked about Mill doing kind of like a hack uh, to get some objectivity out of the world of subjectivity. We had that map of all possible experience and that allows us to take the subjective contingencies of each of our individual experiences, which are always different from each other, but splay them out on a kind of common playing field. Um, in a similar way here, Mill is saying, you know, if someone cares about something, boom, it gets on the map. It gets into the conversation. It's something to think about. But if there is something that we actually all care about, then we could use that as a foundation for sorting out the other things that we don't agree about. And Mill is saying, it doesn't really matter where you are on that map. It doesn't matter what particular things that you actually desire. You always think it's good when you get what you want. Like, that's a, it's a very minimal kind of claim. Now, that claim in itself has created a lot of conversation about um, evaluating this argument and whether Mill is, is doing something that he, uh, that, that is a, like a compelling argument. Is there some kind of funky business going on here with that appeal? Um, is there something that is sort of trivial about that uh, rather than something that can be used as a basis for a substantive moral theory? Um, but I'm, I'm not going to go into some of all the really hairy scholastic debates that happen around that. Um, I think we can just say at this point that, you know, Mill is a subjectivist, and he's saying, what else do we have to go on here? But it's pretty noteworthy if there is something that we all care about um, that we can use to mediate the other differences that we have. That's kind of interesting. Um, is there, There's something that w Mill is saying we're all on the same page about. For us to ourselves, we always think it's good when we get what we want. Okay, now that doesn't necessarily justify utilitarianism, because utilitarianism is saying you have to care about everybody's utility, not just your own. Like, it's not just good when I get what I want, but I need to think about everyone else. So the third premise of the argument that gets us to the actual principle of utility is Mill saying, well, okay, if you're going to say that it's good when you get what you want and you don't get what you don't want, what would why why can't you extend that principle that judgment right there to other people's preferences that it's good a good is happening when they get what they want or they don't get what they don't want and the only way we could do, uh, say no to that mill says is if we were able to show like here's where a, a line in the sand is drawn here's a condition under why it's good when i get what i want but it's not good when you get what you want but mill's like I don't know what you could use to justify that. There isn't going to be anything to justify that. Um, so by sort of pain of logical contradiction or holding double standards, if I'm going to say it's good when I get what I want, when my utility is served, then I have to say it's good too. Goodness is happening as well when you get what you want. And that's getting us to the principle of utility. So it's, uh, it's interesting, I think, how Mill starts with an appeal to our feelings uh, and then uh, extends them with logic. So logic gets in here, um, but like, like I was saying earlier, Mill rejects logic as a source of moral justification, but only in a fundamental way. He's kind of saying logic itself, with no other premises, doesn't get the ball moving on what is good. But once sentiments get the ball rolling, then we want to use reason to make sure that our judgments are consistent, that they're not contradictory, um, and those are standards of logic that are useful. Okay, now some of the themes that are in that first argument, the first phase, that just try to prove that the principle of utility is a universal criteria of morality, 
um, that it's what we care about, not just what Mill cares about, that he's saying we should have his values or something, but he's saying, you already care about this. You already care about utility, and on pain of logical contradiction, you got to be able to respect other people's utility too. Um, the themes that are going on in that argument are going to show up in round two, in the second phase of Mill's argument, where he's trying to show that utility is the only universal criteria of morality. And what he's going to try to do is, again, appeal to sentiments. Okay, So his sentimentalism is like, if you're going to have a debate about morality, the only evidence that can be presented here are feelings, um, what we actually care about. Uh, I mentioned, I think, on Tuesday that you know, Mill is, is really not trying to create a moral theory that's just his own idiosyncratic perspective on life. Um, he doesn't think that he's inventing something that is, uh, you know, unique to him. It, I think the better way to, to see what, Mill, what motivates Mill here is really trying to, to create a moral theory that captures what we already care about. That he, Mill's always saying, this isn't about what I care about. This is what you care about. <laughs> I'm just describing it theoretically. And for the purpose of trying to help us be consistent about it, and to also show how the things that we morally disagree about are actually resolvable, but not with saying, like, we're fundamentally right and you're fundamentally wrong, or something like that. I mean, I think by uh, what's sort of in the back of Mill's mind is that he's like, I'm finding a basis for a moral theory that everyone can identify with that everyone is really already on board for, they may just not recognize it, they may not notice it, and then have double standards about how they're using this principle for themselves or for the people that they identify in their tribe or in their community or whatever is their circle of concern, and recognize that to really be logically consistent with that, it really needs to be extended further than that. It's kind of like Mills taking the things that we already care about and logically extending them to get us to see how there are other things that, while we might not think we're concerned about them, we sort of have to be concerned about them if, unless we're going to violate all of our morals, period, right? That's part of the strategy here. Like for the ones that I apply to myself. Um, it's, very, it's a very interesting strategy. Okay, so how's this going to work? Well, like I mentioned, there are these two major opponents, and Mill really, he, he gives special uh, criteria here to justice and duty. He's like, this is the one that's really going to threaten utility. He, he thinks that the argument for virtue, that's going to be a little easier to do here than the argument against justice and duty as ultimate uh, moral concerns. So he, he really takes this seriously. He devotes the entirety of chapter 5 to just addressing this kind of opponent. Um, this kind of moral theory in opposition to utilitarianism. Um, but the strategy for both of these is really going to be the same. So let's do the more straightforward one, virtue, see how that works, and then see how this is really the, the basic kind of story that's going to happen with justice as well. All right. So, again, sentimentalism. For Mill, all justification for moral claims comes down to our feelings. So he's thinking... Um, if we wanted to say virtue instead of utility, or even alongside utility, uh, he's, he's like, okay, let's see the case for it. So what are, let's take a look at the sentiments behind our valuing of virtue. If we do care about virtue, you hear people talking about it, They're, it's kind of one of those ubiquitous things. Um, virtue is again a kind of uh, approach to morality that I don't think is very culturally relative. Um, I think uh, virtue is the kind of thinking of ethics in terms of virtue you see showing up in like every culture. I'd, I'd be very hard pressed. I'm not sure I can think of any counterexamples. Maybe if you can think of a culture that doesn't uh, concern itself with this moral concept of virtue, of like the value of a person's character, or what are the characteristics of a good person versus someone who's a bad or evil person. Um, you know, bring it up to me. <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, for all the cultures that I've uh, studied in history and um, cultural anthropology, virtue is one of these kinds of ubiquitous moral concepts that shows up. Now, what is definitely culturally relative are which characteristics are counted as the virtuous ones versus the vicious ones. 
Um, but the kind of that kind of concept is pretty universal. So it is maybe another compelling candidate for what could be a universal condition of morality. And it's getting at something basic to the moral landscape. All right, but Mill's like, okay, well, let's take a look at that, and let's look at the feelings that back it up. And Mill uses a, a kind of a thought experiment to talk about this. Um, and I want to walk you through it. I'm, I'm going to do it in a kind of modern, updated version, though. So let's say um, I'm walking down the street, going home, and I see a kid playing with a ball. And the ball rolls out into the street, and the kid just goes chasing after it. And I see a truck coming. And the truck is uh, sees the kid, slams on the brakes, but I can tell that it's not going to stop in time. This kid's going to be killed. So I run out into the street, and I throw the kid to safety, and I get hit by the by the truck and die. Uh, if I, I'm probably going to show up on the evening news, and what are people going to say about me? They're going to say, like, wow, the hero saves child, you know, this incredibly virtuous person um, who was willing to sacrifice. They had this character trait that I had this character trait, that I was willing to sacrifice my life, my own life, in order to save the life of another to this kid. Um, and probably it's going to bring up a lot of emotions and feelings and sentiments in people that are like, wow. Like, maybe, even if you're like, I wouldn't do that, um, but you would still be like, damn, like, that's some serious virtue right there. Respect, right? Um, that would happen. Okay, so let's take now a second case. I'm walking home, same kind of setup. I'm walking home, and I see you cross the street, and your cell phone drops out of your pocket, lands on the ground, and you keep walking. And your phone is just defenseless in the middle of the street, and there's a truck coming, and the truck sees the cell phone and slams on the brakes, but I can tell it's not going to stop in time to, to avoid crushing your phone. So I run out into the street, I throw your phone to safety on this light, nice soft grass, and um, die. Now, what, are the, what, what is the news going to say about me? Not that I'm some, like, amazing hero, but I'm just some dumbass. Like, Florida man sacrifices life to save cell phone. <laughs> like, what? Like, no one's going to think that that's awesome. Um, there's not going to be any kind of deep respect or, or hand clapping or anything for that kind of behavior. Um, I mean, I still have the same character trait. I'm willing to sacrifice my own life for some other good. Um, but everyone's going to be like, that's, that's freaking stupid. Um, that's not valuable. And so Mill's going to say, all right, what's going on here? If we really did think of this virtue, like this, this character trait that I have of a willingness to sacrifice my life for some other good, um, we, if we really thought of that as something intrinsically valuable, then Mill thinks we should value it no matter what happened, no matter the sort of outcome or the consequences. But he's like, that's not what we actually do. That's not the shape of the sentiments that we have that back up virtue as being something valuable. Basically, what Mill's trying to appeal to here is to say, not about speaking about just his feelings, but he's saying, our feelings, if we, if those of you who love virtue, you don't love this, right? And what's the variable that's different? I have the same character traits in both cases, um, the, the key variable that's different here, he says, is really, arguably, utility. Um, my life has a lot of utility, and to lose it is a lot of disutility. A human life is just got so much utility to it. Um, and uh, the same goes for the child. child has a lot of utility. In fact, maybe even has more than me, since they have, all other things being equal, a longer life to live that's full of more good things that if they died, they'd be deprived of. Um, a lot of utilitarian arguments about what makes killing wrong talk about how it's, it's killing someone is kind of like stealing their future. You're taking away all the good consequences that would happen from them. Um, so that's the, the way in which it is something morally bad. Um, and so, you know, the death of the young we'd consider more tragic than someone who's on their deathbed. Um, that if they got hit by a truck and died, it, it would be sad. It would be something morally tragic because they had some things taken away from them. Um, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have as many bad consequences as like a six-year-old losing their life when they have so many, uh, so many more good things to look forward to in their life, all other things being equal, right? Okay, so Mill is saying the really key variable here is the difference in utility. My life might be worth a child's life, but it's not worth your cell phone. 
Losing your cell phone? Would that be disutility? Oh yeah. Like, that'd be really inconvenient. You'd have to buy another one. You'd have to, like, transfer all your contacts. Maybe, you know, it's just really inconvenient, right? And that's a disutility cost. But it just can't hold a candle to, like, the disutility of me losing my life. It's not worth what we're paying. Um, it has this kind of economic, you know, maximizing uh, uh, element to it. And Mill thinks we're sensitive to that. Our sentiments are sensitive to that. So really, Mill, Mill's saying... If we test our feelings around virtue, what we're going to find is that we like virtue when it promotes utility. And when it doesn't promote utility, we don't like it. And we sort of like it to the degree that it promotes utility. Um, that that's the kind of key variable that the sentiments that back up our care about virtue uh, have to them. Which means, which gives us the basis for drawing the conclusion that utility here is the more fundamental value. Virtue is valuable. But just because virtue is something that can promote utility, people that are not like like my example of kidnapping students and torturing them in my basement, like someone who has a character that isn't um, uh, say a sadistic, is going to promote utility more or, or promote sorry promote utility less than someone who is compassionate, empathetic, altruistic, right? So um, people who are um, honest and kind and sensitive, all these sorts of things. Um, we like those traits because they, uh, all other things being equal, promote utility. Sorry about that. I had to pause the video to avoid the sneeze attack. Getting over the microphone. Sorry about that. Okay. So one way I could de describe the strategy of Mill's argument here, and or sort of like the a metaphor that sort of captures the logic of what he's appealing to is imagine that these values are like objects you're holding in your hands so we're holding virtue and from the outside like the outward appearance of it it's about character right and when we hold it we're like ooh this thing really matters right it's got some heft to it it's got some weight but mills like crack it open and see what's inside and if we break it open we'll see inside there's this like dense metal ball that's responsible for all the weight of the thing and that's really utility utility is the value embedded inside of virtue that's really why we care about it so much why we find it so weighty or significant and meaningful that's really what mill's whole strategy is here take these other values of things people care about crack them open and you'll find they bleed utility that they're really the 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 heart of them is this concern about utility. And that's going to be the strategy here for dealing with justice, too. Now, the, the justice, I think the virtue thing is kind of kind of makes sense. And um, with the justice, I, Mill's argument, I think, is maybe a little less plausible. Um, but this is all, you know, you should think about this for yourself. Think critically about Mill's arguments here, whether you buy them, whether you think they, they do make sense, they do hold water or not. Hmm. Before I move on to justice, though, here's, a, here's another little detail that I think is helpful. So Mill says, um, you know, if, if he's right about this, why are we ever confused about it? You know, why would we confuse virtue as being an ultimate criteria of morality um, if it's really so contingent on our concern with utility, that our sentiments are just clearly speaking in favor of utility with respect to virtue? And he says, well... What can happen in human psychology, and I, I think he's right about this, personally I think he's right about this, um, but he says when it comes to human psychology, there are things that we value as a means for something else, like going back to the picture here, something that we value and think is good for the sake of something else, it's as a means to some other end, um, but once the, uh, so it's our concern with the end, say utility, which is why we care about something else like virtue, right, but um, once we see it as a, an object of value, whether it's a means or an end, uh, or if it is a means, and we see that as valuable and we work towards pursuing it, what can sometimes happen is we confuse it as an end in itself. We sort of forget about why we cared about it in the first place. And I think there's some really good examples for this. Um, one of them is very relevant to our class, and Mill talks about it explicitly here too. But the other one I think that's useful here is a, a kind of a religious example. It's actually connected with the conversation I was having with a student uh, this week. Um, but say in religion has like all the, all religions have like rituals to them. 
and those rituals have purpose they have meaning um and even if you're not religious i think you can kind of understand this that you know people have certain um they might look like arbitrary activities like almost like playing pretend or something or like doing prayers or lighting incense or all sorts of stuff right these ritualistic activities and they um they all have a purpose behind them they're they're uh woven into the spiritual life of that tradition and they they have a functional role to play they're not just arbitrary playing pretend types of activities um, but they're done for purpose but over time what you can see in religious traditions and in religious communities or even in a particular religious person is that they might forget about why they're doing those things like what is the purpose or function of them why would it be valuable and they just start doing them for their own sake the rituals become an end in themselves rather than something that is in service to something else and that's the thing that really matters and that's where i think some some of the criticisms that sometimes get leveraged against religions i think can do stick you know and i'm i'm a religious person i'm like not all religious practices like doing it right right <laughs> there's huge mistakes that can happen that turn the whole thing into something maybe silly or stupid or meaningless and this can be something that happens around ritual that ritual can become meaningless when we lose track of how it's really in service to something else and uh it becomes an end in itself kind of like someone take, well, i'll just use a christian example here since christianity is so common in america um someone who's just going to church on sunday because that's the right thing to do they're not listening they're not thinking they're not reflecting they're not meditating they're not in prayer they're not thinking about god they're not thinking about their life they're just like i just need to go there and sit in the pew and that's the thing i'm supposed to do and that somehow is valuable all by itself and i would say that's probably confusion right this is the kind of thing that mill's complaining about so uh, the other one that he brings up explicitly is money. Money is something that's valuable, but not for its own sake. Um, to value money for its own sake is kind of absurd. And the, uh, the best example I have of anyone who would be that would just be uh, Scrooge McDuck, who's a cartoon character. <laughs> it's like, I, maybe I talked about this on Tuesday, but um, that's not, he's not a real person. Scrooge McDuck's not a real person. Uh, we can't value um, money as just an intrinsically valuable thing. We always value it for the sake of something else. We want to have the money because of what we can spend it on, the goods and services that we can procure by having the money to to buy those things, um, or just having the money as a kind of security even. All right? If I, if I don't want to spend the money, it might still be valuable to me, in the event that like an emergency happens and I want the peace of mind of knowing that we'll be able to deal with that if it did come up even if it never comes up there's still advantage to that um, but that's still not valuing money for its own sake that's valuing security and safety so Mill is saying the same thing happens with virtue when we started caring about virtue the original rationale of this is to promote utility but then we can forget about that part of it and just start valuing it for its own sake um, okay, and that would be a confusion of value. All right, let, I'm I'm already at a half hour, so I'm going to try to make this justice thing fast. Lot to say here, um, but here are the highlights from Mill's story. First up, he needs to define justice, and that's very prudent of Mill to do because a lot of people mean a lot of different things when they use the term justice, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, just uh, throughout the whole quarter actually about how how much ambiguity there is around justice um, and how many different ideas of it that there are to consider. But <clears throat> Mill says the thing that's sort of common to all these different conceptions of justice, and and I don't think he's technically right about this, but he's definitely right about it in terms of how justice is a threat to utilitarianism so if that makes sense so if you have problems with this definition i'd kind of agree with you about that but i think it's still i uh, i would i would argue here that for the purposes of something a sense of justice that's actually going to go against utilitarianism that is like a reasonable rational opponent to utilitarianism mill's definition works pretty good here here's his definition all different conceptions of justice boil down to these two kinds of structural features of the moral reasoning that involves it. One, that there are these absolute rules that can never be violated. And if they are violated, two, that would authorize some kind of punishment. And 
punishment itself is an ambiguous notion. I mean, people can throw around a lot of different ideas of what punishment means, especially in the context of what justice is. But I want to encourage us to consider it uh, that punishment is just like interventionary use of force. So sometimes this is um, retributive, like uh, retributive justice is kind of like the eye for an eye thing, like bad people do bad things, deserve bad things done to them kind of thing. So there's that kind of sense of punitive punishments, um, which could involve like jail, death penalty, fines, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but they, there, there's also senses of punishment that are not purely punitive. Um, in this, it maybe if, if you've ever heard of, oops, the uh, term restorative justice, um, there's other kinds of punishments we can imagine like community service or rehab, um, like going to meetings or something to get informed. Like if you, if you get caught with a DUI, you know, part of your punishment might be to go to some classes or something. Um, all of those kinds of punishments still fit, like th those two categories, the common denominator there is that they all involve interventionary use of force. So whether cops are putting you in jail or making you do community service, there's still this forcing, right, that otherwise it wouldn't be right to do those things. Like, it wouldn't be right to jail people if they did nothing wrong, and it wouldn't be right to, like, demand under threat of prison that you serve community service time uh, unless you had done something wrong, right? Okay, so the idea of justice here is these necessary rules that if violate, justify interventionary use of force in ways that wouldn't normally be justified. Okay, so those are the kind of two key ideas for justice, according to Mill, for the sake of this argument. All right, so just like with virtue, Mill's like, what are the sentiments that back that up? What are the what are the concerns here? Uh, why do we find these uh, ways of morally reasoning compelling? Why do we find these kinds of moral concepts, regardless of their content, uh, something significant and compelling? And Mill thinks it comes down to two instincts. This is what he hypothesizes, and I say instinct because they are sentiments that are not just like passing feelings, but are like very deeply rooted. One of them is the impulse of self-defense, and the other is this uh, kind of empathy or compassion for the suffering of others. Uh, the sympathy for others' suffering, Mill says. So um, both of these, he says, are so deeply rooted in our psychologies for those people who have them, because maybe there are some counterexamples there, but for people who feel these things, they feel so strong, so overpowering, so automatic, um, that they feel necessary. So the idea of having necessary rules that you can never violate, like absolute rules, Mill thinks is a conceptual or rational derivative of the way in which those emotions feel to us when we experience them. Like, if you're coming at me with a knife, my impulse of self-defense is going to have me, like, drop whatever else I'm doing or putting my attention on to, like, defend myself, right? Um, or to use an example about sympathy for others suffering, I like this example. I, I cooked this one up. Uh, I'm going home, checking the mail, kind of at the end of the day, and I look over to my neighbor's yard, and I just see him, like, kicking a puppy, just kicking the shit out of a puppy, or, or maybe, like, a, a, a kid or something. I mean, I'm going to be... I, that's witnessing that and the way it's going to make me feel the sympathy for the suffering of others is going to be so powerful and automatic everything else like whatever mail I had I it's just like I just drop it like everything in my mind whew, out all the attention is fixated on that um, it, it's so overpowering overwhelming automatic that it just feels necessary um, so that's where that's where Mill thinks those are the sentiments that would give us the idea of necessary rules. How about the appropriateness of interventionary force or punishment? Well, Mill says, look at the content of those sentiments. Um, what is self-defense going to get me to do? Use force to defend myself, whether that's attacking my attacker or just using force to like interrupt the violence being done to me. Um, if I'm in this scenario, I go home and check the mail and see my neighbor kicking a puppy or a kid or something, what am I going to do? I'm going to get in the middle of them. I'm going to use force to stop the harm, right? Um, to prevent that from happening. Um, even if it means I'm the one who receives the blows, I'm still putting my body physically in the way of this other person's suffering. Um, so Mill thinks those things um, 
uh, are where the, the content of those instincts and sentiments is where we get the idea of the appropriateness of interventionary force. Okay, the, to just finish off the argument, <clears throat> the final step is for Mill to just say, well, look at what those sentiments are concerned about. The impulse of self-defense is a concern about my utility. And the sympathy for the suffering of others is a concern about their utility. That's utilitarianism. So Mill thinks, even um, in, the, in the case of justice, when we're, when we're concerned about people's rights, or we're concerned about um, the obligations people have toward each other, that really all of these rules boil down to a justification on the basis of promoting utility. And this is especially useful for him as he wants utilitarianism to be like a kind of moral standard that can be applied to governments and legal systems and laws and all that kind of stuff is that he's saying, look, these laws are not absolute values. If they no longer are serving people, if they aren't serving people's happiness, then they're not right. We, we shouldn't follow them. They don't have any independent uh, consideration of justice that could justify them other than the utility. So to see this as the underlying basis is able to kind of put a check on them. And that's something I think Mill definitely thinks of as super valuable. Um, I think he's worried that a lot of times this notion of justice just becomes another uh, sort of canvas on which we can project values that maybe aren't actually justified ultimately and that they need some kind of corrective to them. Okay, so... Um, Sorry, I don't know why I keep clicking that. Uh, that's the story for utilitarianism. That's Mill's attempt to try to show uh, that utilitarianism is a universal moral theory. And it kind of boils down to him just saying, uh, first off, this really crucial premise about how our feelings are the guide to what is morally true, objectively, even though they're subjective. Um, and he's basically saying to you, look, if you disagree with utilitarianism, you're wrong because you actually already are a utilitarian. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really the argument. He's like, everyone is a utilitarian. It's just some people are in the closet or haven't woken up to figuring that out yet. And that's, that's the actual argument. It's not Mill saying, on my authority or on some sort of external reason, like a stance independent type of conception of moral truth, that uh, you ought to be a utilitarian, and you're wrong if you don't believe that. He's really saying, look, this is what we believe. This is how we think about morality already. Um, it's the universal common denominator, and it's the even all the other things that we care about that don't look to be utility, ultimately our commitment to those values is because of our commitment to utility. And all Mill's trying to do is trying to reveal that to us, to, to show that to us. That's his appeal. Okay, um, <clears throat> so at this point, um, I'm going to pick up and start talking about Kant and try to get us like just a little bit of the way toward like paving the way for doing Kant um, to try to move the class along. So if you're in my uh, 260 class, this is where you should be picking up. Um, if you're in my 360 class, we're going to keep going on this. And, and I know I, I said I was going to try to keep this video short. Uh, I, I have some ambitions for how much material we get through, and I'm just going to try to make that happen. So um, for those of you in the 260 class, this is not something you're used to. The 360 class is used to this, but I'm actually going to make a little quiz. that um, you'll. It's a very simple quiz. It's just going to ask you to put down a password, uh, like a code word that I'm going to give you in this at some point during the video. Uh, that you'll input into the quiz to just prove that you watched this video. And it's going to serve you as uh, attendance credit. So uh, I, I'm not just requiring you to watch this, but I'm also going to kind of reward you for watching it too. Um, so I appreciate your time. I appreciate your investment in this class and getting something out of it, and I want that reflected in your grade. So uh, that'll be happening. So stay tuned as you're watching the video. Make sure you're listening for when I give you the code word, and then that's the thing that you'll put into the quiz on Canvas. And if you have any questions about this, of course, call me up, text me. Uh, I'm happy to clear it up. But let's get into Kant a little bit. And um, for the sake of time, I'm going to be trying to cut down my usual introduction to Kant, uh, which is tough. Like, I'm kind of uh, doing this right now. My posture, my body language is trying to communicate something, and this is what it's trying to communicate. 
Kant is weird and he's tough. And I always have a couple students who are like, Tim, you say he's tough and weird, but man, he just made so much sense to me. And maybe you're in that boat. Maybe Kant just clicks for you and that's great. But I am pretty confident that the, that's not going to be everybody and it's not going to be most of you either. So um, Kant is someone who is, I, I don't say this very lightly or very often, but Kant is one of these uh, thinkers who's just really unique, um, very strange, very idiosyncratic, very outside of the box kind of person. Uh, doesn't look at the world in the same way that it's na naturally or traditionally thought about. Uh, it's, he's he's definitely an original thinker in the full meaning of that word. And what's weird is that at the same time, I don't think that the moral theory that Kant is giving is really idiosyncratic to how weird Kant is as an individual human being. And in fact, there are a couple people... Um, that I think of uh, as being like Kant in, for cultures and times that are very distant from Kant. Kant is a uh, 18th century German philosopher, but like there's like the second century Buddhist uh, named Nagarjuna. So second century Buddhism, Eastern philosophy, and I think he he, you know, I'm a Buddhist, so I'm but I'm not like super big on like totally committing to the existence of reincarnation. But if I believed in reincarnation more robustly, I would be like, yeah, Kant might be a reincarnation of Nagarjuna. Their thinking is like very, very similar, even though they have no contact with each other. Um, they never were like, there's no way Kant was exposed to Nagarjuna. Um, I can't imagine that happening. And Nagarjuna writes in poetry. <clears throat> Kant writes in prose. Um, they're both difficult writers to understand too. But anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Bottom line is that to understand Kant, especially if you're going through the primary sources, uh, the grounding and metaphysics of morals is what I gave you to work off of, um, it might be very, very, very confusing at first. And the way that he talks, uh, the kind of language that he uses, his thought process, um, can be hard to wrap your head around because it's so weird and different than how we normally think about things. But what's strange is that at the end of the day, the moral theory that we get is something that I think is remarkably intuitive um, and probably very common. Um, I think if you did take a look at the grounding and metaphysics of morals, there's going to be all these little nuggets like <clears throat> it might be like a paragraph or a couple sentences you're like, this is totally clear to me. I know exactly what Kant's talking about here. Like, yeah, absolutely. But then when you like zoom out and you're trying to put all those pieces together, you're like, what the hell is happening here? <laughs> so what I'm going to try to do is help with that. And I've got a uh, concept map, actually, I'll be using in class next week that I want to lay out, like, here's the complete map of what Kant is up to. And now he's going on his journey here to, to create this moral theory that is universal. He's also trying to make a universal moral theory. And in some ways, I'd say Kant is even more sensitive to contingency than, than even Mill is. Um, Mill is not trying to create a moral theory that is only if you were like a part of his culture or you have a similar personality to him that you're going to agree with. And Kant is even more worried about that. In other words, both of these philosophers, but Kant maybe even more than Mill, are so concerned about a moral theory that we agree with only because of bias. That it's not really for everybody, that they're, it's going to be excluding certain voices um, in a way that begs the question against them that's just assuming that they're wrong without having any argument to back it up. I mean, Kant is so, so, so concerned about this in all aspects of his philosophy, not just his moral philosophy. And that's the other thing about Kant. He did everything. He revolutionized uh, or made really significant, important contributions to every single major area in philosophy. He was one of the last systematic philosophers, someone who's trying to touch on everything in a way that has a consistent pattern and theory to it, which is just a overwhelmingly difficult type of um, theoretical project to, and ambition to attempt. Um, and I think he meets with a lot of success with it. Um, it, it might seem it's so ambitious it couldn't possibly work out, but it's, it's sort of remarkable, I think, what he achieves. I don't agree with Kant about everything, but um, some pretty pretty important new things happened with Kant. He threw a big stone in the pond, in other words. Um, <clears throat> but that's what's sort of the paradox of Kant, is 
he's different, he's idiosyncratic, he's weird, and he had a big influence intellectually in the history of Western philosophy, and yet it's really accessible in another weird sort of way. Like, you don't have to be as strange as Kant to get at this stuff. And this is what Kant says about his own moral philosophy. He says, I did not invent the categorical imperative, which is his name for the supreme moral law. Kind of like uh, Kant's version of Mill's principle of utility. Uh, he's like, I did not invent this. I am just giving a theoretical description of it. And Kant says, and you might not believe him at all if you've taken a look at the reading, but he says that his moral theory is just what ordinary people believe, non-philosophers. And you might be like, what? This theory is so confusing, Kant, I'd have to be a philosopher to understand it. And Kant would say, well, maybe you, it's pretty advanced or complicated the way I'm giving this theoretical articulation of what's going on. But the things that Kant is describing are the kinds of moral intuitions or kind of um, moral perspectives that we automatically recognize as authoritative and then end up acting on, even if we don't know what we're doing or could talk about or articulate it with this kind of philosophical precision that Kant's aiming for in his theory. Okay? But he thinks it's, some, it's kind of like how someone could, I have used this moral landscape metaphor, I'm going to use it again. So you could imagine you've got this moral landscape. You can imagine someone who's good at navigating it without a map. And that's what Kant, I think, would say is all of us, uh, if we're not philosophers and we're thinking about moral matters, um, the, the theory that he's providing sketches that landscape that you're navigating even if you don't have the map. And it's kind of cool to have the map, too, even if you can kind of do it on your own, um, to be able to avoid double standards or moral blind spots, or to be able to, when people challenge your moral perspectives or values, how you're able to justify and defend them. That would require having a theoretical map to be able to say, like, what's going on. Like, if someone's like, I don't know why we should be going this way, and you're like, this is the right way to go, and they're like, can you give me something more about why I should have confidence in your judgment? And you might, if you just have it on intuition, you're like, no, sorry, I don't have anything to say. It's just what I know is right. And Kant's like, well, hey, check out my theory. Now you'll have some language to use for it. Um, and you can have more confidence in knowing uh, if that if you have the theoretical background with it that this isn't just your feelings about it. It's not just your intuition, but there actually is this very deep rational justification for why to think about morality in this sort of way. So that's some of the background here for what Kant's going to be up to. Um, but I want to give you some more um, theoretical background for Kant himself. Um, if you've taken a look at my lecture notes on Kant, or if, if you have already, or when you do, if you're going to do that in the future, you'll see I start the lecture notes with this whole huge thing on a priori, what, what this phrase a priori means. Um, and I'm not uh, going to be going through those lecture notes in their full detail. Those are All those lecture notes that I made accessible to you are taken from my ethical theory class that I teach, um, where the whole focus is on, like we spend half the, not more, half or even more than half of the quarter just on Kant, Mill, and Aristotle. So they're much more extensive, uh, exhaustive presentations of the theories, so we're not going to do all that. But I need to talk about it a little bit. Um, this distinction between a priori and a posteriori claims or knowledge is really significant to Kant in all of his philosophy, not just his moral philosophy. And let me do some some drawing here again to help with this. So let's do. Whoa, that's not what I wanted. There we go. All right. <clears throat> uh, and I, I'm just going to type these out so you can see what they look like a priori and a posteriori. There we go. Um, the a priori versus the a posteriori is really a matter of whether something is dependent, uh, whether a claim, in order to be known, is known on the basis of experience or not. If I need to have experience, to know something, then it's known a posteriori. If something is known a priori, 
then it is it's the truth of it, the rational justification of it, um, does not depend on experience. Okay, so something that's known a priori is known independently of any particular experiences that we have. And most of the knowledge we have is a posteriori. It requires having some sensations, some sens sensory input to be able to know about. Like, am I wearing a hat right now? Look on the screen. Yep, I'm wearing a hat, right? I have to have some sensations to know that's true. If I'm going to know, like, who's president of the United States right now? I'm going to have to have some empirical observations that tell me about that, even if it's just someone else's report, right? Like the newspapers announced Donald Trump won the, won the election, so he's president now. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's true. Even that is empirical evidence. Um, and empirical evidence just means uh, evidence on the basis of observation. So all of science depends, even the theoretical stuff, depends on experience. We're testing things with the scientific method. That means running experiments and observing the results and then basing our justification of the hypotheses and claims we make about reality as accountable to those things. So all of those are a posteriori. What are things that are known a priori? Well, the really classic ones are math and logic and math because it's built from logic. Um, to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 doesn't require any knowledge about the world. I don't need to have any experience of the world to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. The, in other words, the thing that makes 2 plus 2 equal 4 is not some kind of contingent fact or state of affairs or circumstances that are happening out in the world. Like whether the speed of light is the blah 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 value that it is, well, the world could have been a different way. And in fact, just as a side note, there's actually some current theories in physics that are like, maybe the constants like speed of light, gravitational constant, cosmological constant, are actually not as stable as we think they are, and under different circumstances actually change. Um, so that's a good example of how like, yeah, we have to actually observe the world to figure out what we're supposed to think about it. But when it comes to things like math, that doesn't seem to be true. What makes 2 plus 2 equal 4 is something that's just bit on the basis of the concepts involved. If I've got the concept of two, equality, addition, and four, I should be able to confirm that this is true. Um, and the same thing goes with logic as well. These are things that are necessarily true, and their truth doesn't depend on the states of affairs of the world, the contingencies of circumstance. Um, now, here's where there's an interesting question for ethics. Ethics seems to also be a priori. And the most basic justification for this is that uh, ethics and morality is about how the world ought to be, not about how it is. It's about how it ought to be. All observations of the world in experience can show me is how things actually are, not about how they ought to be. Um, so that's why I can't use experience to justify morality at a fundamental level. Now you might be wondering to yourself, and we, we, I think we kind of talked about this maybe earlier in the quarter. Um, you're like, but man, life experience has taught me so much about what it is to be a good person, or what, it, what are the right actions to take, things like that. You learn from life experience, and that's true. We do learn how to be, how to make better choices by having life experience, but arguably not on that alone. So think back to, we've already done utilitarianism, so I'm going to use it as an example. How could I know that the principle of utility is correct? Well, for Mill, it depends on our feelings. Um, but what he sort of picks out is that it doesn't matter what particular feelings you have, all your feelings for whatever you value end up valuing utility. That's kind of an interesting fact about it, right? Um, but, but let's leave that off to the side just for one second here. Um, if I know that the principle of utility is the, the law that should be governing all of my ethical choices, at, what am I needing to do in order to actually be effective at maximizing utility? I need to have some knowledge about how the world works. I need to know the facts about what people care about, uh, how certain actions will lead to certain results, um, and that's stuff that observation from the world tells me about. As I learn how the world works, now I know which actions will promote utility more than others. 
so it helps to inform what I ought to do, but not on a fundamental level. It's just assisting or aiding a fundamental moral premise I have, the principle of utility, in how to execute on it the best. Okay? And that's why uh, there, there, there are some connections here I could make with accounting and with the economy, where like learning how the economy works doesn't necessarily tell you about economic justice, right? of what should happen. It'll just tell you the kind of framework of the consequence that if I do this versus that, right? Like, if I do this, will the business be viable or not? But there could be a question of, like, should it be viable? Right? Like, if we could start selling ourselves as slaves on eBay, that's probably economically viable, but maybe it's wrong <laughs> on some terms of justice, right? Or human rights, that this shouldn't be allowed to do that kind of thing. So it doesn't matter if it would, like, Ah, that would work, help the economy, and blah, blah, blah. Maybe it would promote market efficiencies or whatever. That's kind of like beside the point if that would be true, if it's like fundamentally wrong. Okay? So all this goes to show is that even if learning some things on the basis of experience about how the world works does help to inform moral choices, it can't do so in a fundamental way. That the the rational foundations of all moral reasoning are going to be for normative principles that themselves are not justified on the basis of experience but are actually known a priori okay so Kant calls all of ethics an a priori discipline um, the a posteriori version of normative inquiry inquiry about good and bad and right and wrong Kant calls cultural anthropology um, things like psychology sociology that's all in this category of what he calls cultural anthropology and what's interesting about this is that anthropology psychology and sociology don't tell you what values you ought to have or what beliefs you should have but they just tell you which beliefs people do have right that's all or how our minds do work not maybe how they ought to work or what should I do with them or something like that that's all going to be in the the a priori world of ethics okay Something else uh, I want to give you um, before the, I cut this video off, um, and this is just a little sneak preview of Kant's metaphysics and his epistemology. So this is going to have nothing to do with ethics, but I promise you this is parallel to what Kant wants to do when it comes to ethical claims. So I've been, just been talking a big game about how the world of descriptive matters is different like the world of science and stuff like that is different than the world of normative matters of right and wrong and good and bad the stuff of ethics um, I've just been saying how separate those are um, and that's true and for Kant it's true too but Kant thinks that when it comes to rational truth-seeking that there's some really interesting parallels between how these two different worlds operate and how we make judgments about them and so I'm going to talk right now about what Kant says about basically science all on its own before we get to what he says about morality. And if what I'm going to say here in the rest of this video is confusing and doesn't make sense to you, don't sweat it. Um, if it doesn't work, that's okay. Um, but if it does make sense, some kind of sense, I think it'll be helpful. So this is really not something I'd say is crucial to understand, to be able to understand Kant's moral theory. But I find it so helpful um, personally with myself and uh, helping to head off possible misconceptions or to understand what Kant's doing on a deeper level. Um, I find it uh, so useful to make these connections and I'm kind of just throwing them out there and hoping something sticks. Uh, and if you want to talk about it more with me, by all means do so. Um, I love talking about Kant. He's just, he's just really weird <laughs> and, and kind of trippy. Um, Sometimes uh, when I teach this kind of stuff about Kant with my students, it's a little like, like mind blown kind of stuff. So maybe you'll have that enjoyable experience. Some of you might have a frustrating experience about how weird this is too, and that's, you know, there's room for all those things to happen. Maybe both. <laughs> all right, but let's let's talk a little bit about how Kant explores truth seeking. And the model is one, in a nutshell, of kind of trying to not just plow ahead with a debate where we start appealing to our intuitions or what we already believe or stuff like that but Kant's always wondering about the ultimate foundation of rational justification for any claim period and he's especially worried about skepticism 
and skeptical conclusions, um, ways in which we might not know anything at all. And he's trying to defend the, basically defend rationality, um, the rational accountability of our judgments. Um, he is going to be a subjectivist, like Mill, but Mill was a subjectivist because of his appeal to emotion. Kant's going to be a subjectivist on the grounds of appealing to logic, which you may not think of as being subjective, but for Kant it absolutely is. That the world of human experience and sensation and judgment is actually a highly conditioned and constructed space. And even the logical components of it are subjective too, because they sort of condition what it's like for beings like us to think and that we don't actually see reality as it actually is in itself it's a construction of the mind and we got to be very very careful about that word because Kant is not saying something like if you think it then it becomes real that is not what he's saying he's not this isn't like law of attraction or something like that some kind of like we have magical powers to materialize the universe or something like that but but what Kant is saying is that um, we don't just receive through experience reality directly that there's this huge component of like a filtering of a construction uh, of a subjectivity that makes experience possible for us so in a nutshell Kant's whole theory whether it's on the side of science and his exploration of that kind of world or on the side of morality and what's normative the values of things um, in both cases Kant is trying to reverse engineer the judgments we actually make to see where they're coming from, to kind of reveal the subjectivity that's behind them. And if we're able to understand how we're actually capable of making judgments of these kinds, then we might be able to have some clues about how they could be justified, why it would be what, when we're doing it in the right way versus the wrong way, in other words. So Kant's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like a, a cognitive science deconstruction of thought and experience and everything. So let, let me do some drawing here because drawing is very helpful with explaining all this. Uh, what are we going here? Not uh, okay. So here's um, this. I'm going to be kind of drawing a picture of this reverse engineering idea. Now, and I, I'll do a little bit here. So. Uh, that of the normative side. Um, so I'm going to kind of try to make this a little fancy. Maybe I should have made this picture before I started the lecture, but it's not, I'm not gonna be too complicated. Okay. So these are objects of judgment here that I'm drawing. Um, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And then we're going to wonder like what's responsible for them, where they come from. So just like we were talking about uh, that there's this kind of division between uh, descriptive judgments of states of affairs in the world versus normative judgments of what's good and bad and right and wrong, that's why I'm kind of drawing these on parallel tracks. So what we got right here, uh, down here, is a judgment of something being good. And Kant's curious about, like, okay... You know, where's that coming from? What enables me to make any judgment of good? So not just the particular judgments of good of what I like have an, as an object of value, like I value philosophy or I value Buddhism or I value board games or I value my family or whatever it is, right? Um, how do I just make judgments of goodness regardless of their content, regardless of their object? What is what makes that happen? What makes that possible? In the same way, um, so that's the moral stuff, which we'll talk about a lot more later. I'm giving you Kant's non-moral stuff right now. Kant does the same thing with judgments of existence. If we say that there's an object of experience. So here's an object of experience. And it's got, I'm putting it in this kind of box thing because it's distinguished from other things. Um, and it might have some kind of like very weird, messy content in it, but I still think about it formally as a thing. And a thing, whoa, didn't, that was the wrong thing. Here we go. 
as a thing which can be connected with other things. So I'm putting I'm gonna put a little like handhold here, and here's a handhold on the other side of the box, right? Because I can have other objects of experience, right, that I encounter in experience that I might be able to link up with this box. And the most common pattern of how these things get connected is cause and effect judgments. So when I say X caused Y, I have to think of X as a particular object of experience of a thing that exists or a phenomenon, an event that happened, and Y is a separate one, and then I connect them together. But there have to be some handholds that allow them to be connected together. These are the things Kant's observing about how we actually think that he's like, how would that happen? How is this possible? How do we have these abilities? Um, there's actually a remarkable paper, I don't go too far on this tangent here, but there's a remarkable paper I encountered when I um, was in grad school and really studying a lot of modern cognitive science, which is one of my areas of specialization. That was basically like, Kant is the first person to ask this question. All of modern cognitive science is really trying to figure out how are we capable, like what does the mind have to be like in order for us to have the demonstrated cognitive abilities that we do like being able to talk or being able to do arithmetic or being able to paint paintings or all sorts of things or make moral judgments like what has to be going on in the mind the machinery of the mind Kant's the first person to really ask that question but he's not doing psychology he's not trying to understand how brains work he's trying to understand consciousness itself thought itself reasoning itself and Kant is very clear about this and we're gonna see this in his moral theory too that He's trying to understand the mind, not just for humans, but for any sentient being whatsoever. So I think dolphins are sentient beings. Kant would say, my theories apply to dolphins. If we have extraterrestrial aliens that are like totally different from anything else we've ever encountered before, like, I don't know, maybe they're like, uh, maybe they're a gaseous life form instead of solids or liquids, like a Star Trek reference here, ugly bags of mostly water but they're like just like a sentient cloud or something, Kant would be like, yep, all my theories apply to them too. Because it's not on the basis of the particularities of our thoughts or their contents or anything like that, but what is needed for thoughts to happen at all. When we're talking about objects of experience, Kant's asking, what is an object? How do objects happen? <laughs> How do you, if you're gonna have thoughts, you have to have thoughts of something thoughts of an object what is objecthood that's also what he's getting into it's pretty weird stuff here's in a nutshell his story um, Kant thinks that I'm gonna do a little drawing here do 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 so I'm, I'm drawing this like weird mass of something here like this and it's going to be whoa that's not what I wanted to do I'm going to have it fed into this little machine here that then you can imagine as like a hopper like this like a machine that has this like output and it barfs out objects of experience here is uh, this is consciousness so this is what's happening in consciousness what's happening in uh, experience and this back here, this reverse engineered background story of what's going on, this is the world of what is a priori. Because it's all prior to any experience. It's not dependent on experience. Like the theories that I come up with if I'm a scientist making theories of what causes what other things, that's a posteriori. It's reasoning I do after experience. So we might remark here that uh, reflection is happening on this end of the process. It's not happening over here. This is all we uh, might say uh, behind the scenes. It's not something we're conscious of. Um, and that's why we gotta be doing the reverse engineering part. I don't see the machinery of my mind. What I get is objects of experience, just like confronting me. 
Like you're watching this video right now, you don't know what experience you're going to have next because you don't know what I'm going to say next. But I'm going to come out here and I'm going to say something and you're going to be like, what is this Kant idea? This is crazy. I wasn't anticipating having this experience or feeling today or something. Like you just don't know what's – like life just happens at you. Experience happens at you. And you don't see what's going on behind the curtain. But Kant's like based on what's going on with conscious experience, we can infer – through what he calls a transcendental deduction. Don't worry too much about that for right now. But we can infer what has to be happening behind the scenes in order for experience to turn out the way that it does. How am I able to make causal connections between things? Like, what enables that or empowers that to happen at all? Um, well, there'd have to be something going on here. And here's uh, Kant's big, big idea. Um, I haven't labeled any of these. Let's label them. This is the raw manifold of sensation. And this right here, I'm going to put it in caps, is reason. Not reflective reasoning, but the faculty of reason. This, uh, this, uh, man, I keep pressing the wrong tab. This constitutive element of our minds, um, that is, well, actually, let me just get back to the picture here. It provides the form to experience where the sensations provide the content. So you notice how I drew this as like a box with a squiggly bunch of blah inside? The blah is like the content, and the box is like providing the form. And what Kant is saying is that in order to have thoughts or experiences at all, you need to have form and content. This is actually called hylomorphism. It comes from Aristotle, but that's a whole separate thing. Okay, so I need, I need to not get distracted here on tangents. I'm going to try to be good. It's so easy for me to do it. Okay, Kant says, for you to be able to think at all, your thoughts need to have a content to them, and that comes from sensation. But they also have to have a form, otherwise they wouldn't be thinkable. And that comes from reason. So Kant, there's a really famous quote from him. He says, uh, concepts without sensations are empty. They just don't have anything of substance to them. But sensations without concepts are blind. They are unintelligible noise. I, I like Kant's choice of language here. Well, this is a translation, but this raw manifold of sensation. It's like unprocessed sensation. And it's you can kind of imagine it like white noise. Um, there's no way to pick out any particular information. Um, it's just like everything like any, there's no nothing discernible. Kind of like if you're in a big um, if you're in a big hallway or something with like hundreds of people and you just hear rah, 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 rah. there's a lot of information, but you can't pick out and think about any of it. But you might hear like a certain thread, right? You focus on one kind of wavelength of, of sound. And then and you have to kind of ignore the rest of them, and then it becomes intelligible. Now, any of these analogies I'm going to come up with are imperfect because Kant is trying to make a claim about something that isn't contingent. It isn't empirical. It's not like it's true in some circumstances and not others. Kant is saying, like, for all experiences, they have this contribution of content and of form. The content is the part that's contingent. What's coming down the pipe of sensation, this is always going to be contingent. Oh, you're less man. Contingent. Um, it's like the raw input. But the reason, which is reason, the faculty of reason, which is composed of rules, are necessary and not contingent. Because it's like no matter the contingencies of what's happening here with the with what's coming down the pipe of sensation. It all has to play by these rules in order to be able to constitute objects. So there's this like gate that like all if, if you're going to get an experience of something, everything's got to go through this gate. Now all of this is subjective. Like the construction of our mind is like adding content here. Kant famously says, causality is not something he thinks we can know is real about the world in itself. Causality is something we put into sensation in order to make it thinkable, <laughs> in order to make it intelligible to us, in order for us to be able to think about it. 
And so he says the legitimacy of the authority of something like causal laws only goes as far as the way in which it serves our ability to think about our experiences, specifically in the terms of being able to unify them together. One of the other big ideas from Kant that's absolutely crucial here is that all functions of the mind, like all those different rules that make up what the rational faculty is according to Kant, all of the different things the mind does are all based on one function, the unification of experience being able to fit things together to make sense of them. And one of the really cool ideas that I, it, I was, never got a hold of until I studied Kant was, and, and afterwards I was like, oh man, how come I never noticed that? Kant says all distinctions, like when we separate things with concepts, are actually unifying experience. They're not actually separating them. And think about it like this. How would I know that two things are different that they contrast in some meaningful way unless I was able to hold them together in consciousness at the same time. To know that things are different requires me to think about them with unity, to have conscious unity. If it was just like this thing and then this thing and there was no way for me to relate them to each other like through memory or something like that, then I would never notice how they were different from each other. If it was like, I don't know if you've seen the movie Memento or like someone who has like their memory wiped I like have this experience and then my whole memory is wiped and then I have this experience I wouldn't be able to have any basis to know that they're actually different from each other for Kant imposing distinctions on experience is actually a way to unify experience it helps us make sense of things um, causality is the same way um, and that's the main function of judgments of existence is the unification of experience and causality is very very useful for this but even uh, like the I'm, I'm talking about causality here a little bit because it's going to be kind of similar to um, Kant's way of dealing with moral skepticism too. But he's, he's saying that um, I wouldn't be able to make reflective judgments of like scientific theories if reason wasn't already setting up objects with the affordances, those little handholds, for being able to draw those connections between to tether different objects of experience together. That's all subjectively projected onto reality or onto my experience of reality. It's coming from me, Kant says. And he's like, Kant's like, maybe it's true in the actual world. Maybe there's actual causality or time or space. Time and space are actually also things that Kant thinks are subjective conditions of our experiences and not necessarily real in an ultimate sense. He's like, they might be that way. But I don't know, and I can't. In principle, it's impossible for me to know, because for me to be able to think about anything requires playing by these subjective rules that make thought possible. So, I wouldn't have any basis of being able to say that the world, as it exists in itself, apart from a subjective observer thinking about it, apart from a mind thinking about it, I can't think about that. <laughs> Right? All Kant's saying, the only thing I can think about is experience, which is constructed from things that are subjective about me. And not necessarily subjective in the sense of being contingent. Do you remember when I talked about uh, subjectivism on Tuesday, when, and when I was building that into the debate with realism and relativism? We are saying subjectivists believe that truth is stance-dependent, so it's in the world of subjectivity, but they still believe in objective universal truth. Kant's a perfect example of this, because he's like, you never see reality for itself. You never see how things are in this absolute type of objectivity that stands independent, that has nothing to do with the subjective conditions of what makes thought possible. You're always confined to the subjectivity of the conditions that make thought possible. There's no way to think outside of thinking. However, there are things that are universal and necessary to this subjective world that we're in, that our minds exist in. There are some universal patterns to this. And it's on the basis of those universal patterns that Kant thinks we're going to have some rational standards to evaluate whether uh, a scientific theory is one that, a particular scientific theory is one where we should agree to or disagree with, that we should adopt it as a belief or not as a way of organizing our experiences if it's the best way to do that or it's not the best way to do that. And we need to be having more experiences to try to integrate into that picture rather than just like kind of sitting pat with the ones we currently have. Uh, there is room for Kant still about exploring 
the world or the universe or something. But what we're really exploring is the space of all possible experience, which is an idea I brought up with Mill with you already. The same thing is going to happen here with Kant and morality. So, and, and this is where I'm going to leave the video. Um, I've already made this about an hour and a half, so uh, thank you for watching all of it. I appreciate it. Um, but I'm going to leave you with this. Kant is aware that we have tons of disagreements about which things we think are good. So we make judgments of goodness that have very different objects. And to try to deal with that, um, to try to deal with that disagreement or resolve it, Kant's thinking, okay, first, let's try to deconstruct this. Where's this all coming from? Formally. What is the formal, or what are the sort of rules of reason that are needed to construct any kind of judgment of goodness whatsoever the content of it? So it doesn't matter what the object is. You like Snickers bars. I like Butterfingers. You value freedom. I value well-being. Whatever it is, you know. I'm a Christian Buddhist, you're an atheist, right? Or whatever, whatever our differences are when it comes to our ethical perspectives, um, Kant's wondering, what is it that's necessary in order to make any judgment, no matter what the content is? And that will be a necessary regulative rule that all moral judgments have to play by. And it might be able to help us in figuring out which judgments are better to make than others. And I described in class before, I foreshadowed this, that I'm going to be saying, you know, what Kant's trying to do here is basically squeeze blood from a stone. He's going to be trying to build a substantive, informative, prescriptive moral theory that's universal and objective and necessary based on the objectivity and necessity of logic itself. A very formal type of thing. Not about rich content, but a matter of pure form. A purely a priori, not dependent on any particular experiences at all. That would be applicable no matter what experiences you ever had. Just like over here, like these rational rules that provide the form to experience are the way that they are and affect the outcome regardless of what's happening with the contingencies of the content that's provided by sensation. So Kant's wondering, what are the kinds of moral rules that'd be consistent with those kinds of or what, what moral law could we define that would be consistent with the formal parameters that just make it possible to make any judgments of goodness whatsoever? That's his dream. That maybe logic alone will give us some guidance here about which particular and substantive moral, th moral values we really ought to have. And thus what actions we should do. Along the way, you're going to get a very interesting exploration of moral psychology from Kant. I'm very excited to get into that kind of stuff. Um, it isn't like moral psychology is something these other philosophers don't care about, but Kant puts it in very stark relief. And I think you might find it very interesting, uh, even if you end up rejecting all the rest of Kant's theory and, and you don't agree with it. You also might not think that Kant is actually capable of doing what he's going to try to do, that it, he's not going to get any blood out of this stone, that pure logic is not enough to convince or justify these more substantive moral values. Um, and while it's going to be dry at first here, let me just give you a sneak preview of what Kant's endgame looks like. At the end of the day, Kant's going to be saying that every person, not just every human, but every person, so that would include dolphins and aliens and any other intelligent being that can make judgments with reason. Um, every person is intrinsically valuable, is valuable for their own sake, and can never be used or treated as purely having value as a means for some other end, even if that end is some kind of beneficent one, even if it's some kind of more ideal thing rather than just like selfishness. In other words, Kant's saying, People have fundamental human rights, and Kant's ethical theory is really the basis for human rights theory uh, in morality, um, and that uh, people, another way I can kind of summarize this is, people cannot be treated like tools. They can't be considered disposable. They can't be considered uh, capable of being sacrificed for some greater end. They are ultimate ends in themselves in a way that's unconditional and not dependent on anything. And that all of us 
have a deep, fundamental, necessary, non-negotiable obligation to promote each other's ability to be self-determining and free, autonomous, empowered individuals with agency. And there's no excuses for not doing that. It's a very uh, robust moral theory that involves some pretty substantive values. Like I think the values I just described you would not consider as being superfluous or uncontroversial or trivial or something like that. Um, they're pretty big ideas. But Kant's going to try to prove that you do have those moral obligations um, by just appealing to the principle of non-contradiction. That the this principle from that is the basis of all logic that says claims are either true or false. They cannot be both true and false, and they can't be neither true nor false. That's it. I mean, there's a story here, of course. We're going to have to talk through a very long story about how that argument actually works. Um, but that's Kant's ambition. And so effectively, if someone's not acting morally, they're just not being logical. They're just not rational. And that's a way that you could be able to argue why what they're doing is wrong. And that's, I mean, even if you're like, I'm pretty skeptical that this is going to work out right, you know, that Kant's going to be able to actually cash this check. Uh, but man, it'd be pretty cool if that was true, right? Um, there's a lot of people who don't probably act very just or are not very morally interested, but that fancy themselves being pretty rational. In fact, in the business world especially, uh, and and there people, uh, well, how do I want to put this? There's a culture that commonly is found in the business world that treats and actually maybe defines even rationality as so-called enlightened self-interest. That I it is rational for me to do something if it works into my self-interest. That's not going to be very compatible with Kant's moral theory. And if there's something, if we think there's something morally wrong with only looking out for yourself, no matter what happens to other people, if it works to your benefit, then that's what's rational for you to do. It'd be pretty cool to have a theory like Kant's actually work that says, no, that's not logical. That's not rational. You can't think that way. And not because your values are not my values, but because it's just not logical. This universal sort of necessary condition on whether any thought is intelligible at all. Um, okay. Oh, well, okay. Maybe one more thing. So Kant is basically saying that a certain type of person is impossible. And this is a person that Hume calls the sensible knave. Someone who's a fully rational human, who is perfectly skilled at logic, but which just doesn't give a shit about other people and can ever be motivated to do so. Kant's actually going to say such a person is impossible because if they're not being morally concerned with others, they're just not being rational. And how that could possibly be true, that's going to be the big story we're going to get into next week on Tuesday. I'm very much looking forward to that. Again, thank you for watching this whole video. The code word is... Lava Lamp. That's our code word for this time. Um, I look forward to seeing you next week. I'm very sad about the awkwardness from this week. Say la vie. Um, I didn't run out of time on my computer, thank goodness. And uh, have a great weekend, everyone. I'll see you later. And don't hesitate to call me over the weekend. If, if We've been doing a lot of material here. And if you want to talk about it or catch up on anything or just shoot the shit a little bit and explore some of uh, unpacking some of these ideas, man, I'd love to do that with you. Please don't be shy. Um, if you are, I'm not going to say you're doing something wrong. But on my end, it's so completely welcomed, and I, I look forward to any interactions I have with any of you. Uh, every single one of you. Um, I'm, it's been great getting to know you so far, and I'm really looking forward to everything else the rest of the quarter. So hopefully I'll hear you from you. If not, have a great weekend. I'll see you soon.